Dear students, this is lecture number four in the topic of inflammation. In the previous lecture, we have understood all details needed about the types of acute non-separative inflammation. In this lecture, we are going to learn more about the acute separative inflammation. By the end of this lecture, we should be able to list the types of acute separative inflammation to describe the pathogenesis and composition of pus, to mention the causative organism and the sites of abscess, and also to explain its pathogenesis and complications. I would like to start this lecture in a different way. We will start with a case study, and then by the end of the lecture, we will again revisit the case uh, after we learn about the topic and then we will start to answer some questions related to this case. So we have a five-year-old girl who has fever for three days duration. She complains of sore throat. She went to the doctor and on physical examination she has red swollen tonsils with yellow spots. Swab from the yellow spots obtained yellowish creamy fluid and this fluid was sent for microbiological assessment. This is a photo of her tonsils on physical examination. So from this case we can have some assumptions. First of all this is a case of fever of three days duration so we are in a kind of acute type of condition because it's a few days duration and we have pain uh, in the case so there is pain uh, here represented by the sore throat and also there is fever all are features that can guide us for a diagnosis of inflammation or at least a suspicion of inflammation then the more conclusive or the more uh, confirmative manifestations in the case are the uh, uh, red swollen tonsils so we have redness swelling of the tonsils these are also of the signs of inflammation and in the same time we have some yellow spots that we are going to talk about through the lecture and the yellow spots are yielding yellow creamy fluid this yellow creamy fluid as we are going to understand together is representing pus formation So again, back to our scheme, we have acute inflammation divided into non-separative type and separative type. We have already covered all the non-separative types before, serous, fibrinous, catarrhal, pseudomembranous, allergic, hemorrhagic, necrotizing. Now we are going to start discovering the separative type of acute inflammation. We will see that the separative acute inflammation is also divided into two subtypes, localized and diffuse. So again, what is the meaning of acute separative inflammation? It's an inflammation that is characterized by pus formation. The pus represents the yellow creamy fluid that is going to be oozing from the lesion. Why there is this pus formation or this separation, as we can see? The bacteria that are causing the infection here or the inflammation are pyogenic bacteria. So this feature of pus formation are, uh, is not a feature that is going to be seen with all different types of infections. It has to be certain type of bacteria that is going to cause this kind of inflammation. So what is the pathogenesis of pus formation? Pathogenesis means the mechanism, yani how the pus is going to be formed. We have pyogenic organisms, or let's say some powerful bacteria that are able to cause pus formation. These bacteria, when they attack the tissues, they will do two main, um, let's say, effects. One of the effects is marked tissue necrosis. So we have deaths of extensive areas from the tissue at the site of infection. This is number one. Number two, 
they will exert a powerful chemotactic signals or they will lead to production of a high concentrations of chemical mediators that are going to attract huge numbers of neutrophils. So we have too many neutrophils in this type of inflammation together with market tissue destruction and market tissue necrosis under the effect of this very powerful bacteria. The neutrophils are like the soldiers that are defending the country, defending the body. So in the battles, in the wars, sometimes when you defend the country against an enemy, sometimes also your soldiers die. So this actually is what's going to happen. The uh, large numbers of neutrophils that are infiltrating the, the site of inflammation are going also to be killed somehow by the powerful bacteria. So sometimes they are trying to phagocytose bacteria or destroy bacteria, but in the same time, many neutrophils will die. And we all know that inside the neutrophils, we have a destructive or proteolytic enzymes inside the lysosomes. So when the neutrophils die, these uh, proteolytic enzymes are going to be released in the area. And they are going to start to degrade and destroy everything around. This huge number of neutrophil with increased uh, uh, rate of death and release of proteolytic enzymes will lead to liquefaction of the necrotic tissues. What is the meaning of liquefaction? The proteolytic enzymes are going to degrade the proteins, destroy everything. So the solid tissues will become uh, more or less fluid or liquid-like. So this is the uh, meaning of liquefaction. So this liquefaction is happening under the effect of the proteolytic enzymes and this liquefied necrotic tissue will mix up with our original cocktail of inflammatory exudate that is already coming uh, in the site of inflammation as we agreed before. So we have now cocktail of fluids, necrotic tissues plus bacteria plus inflammatory exudates plus some RBCs all of this cocktail will form the pus, which is called also the separation or the separative uh, exudate. So let's put that into perspective and uh, list the components of pus. So the first component of pus is the liquefied necrotic tissue. Again, why the necrotic tissues here are liquefied? Because the neutrophils that were dead released increased amounts of proteolytic enzymes that led to degradation and destruction of the proteins in the area and in the tissues and this will lead to liquefaction or they will become fluid like not solid anymore. We have also in this pus large numbers of dead and living neutrophils. Okay. In the same time, we will have some RBCs that are extravasated from the dilated vessels in the area of inflammation. We have in the same time the inflammatory fluid exudate that is already formed in inflammation as we already explained before. And it is composed of protein rich fluid together with some cells. And the final component is the bacteria, the microorganisms. They are also um, sharing in this cocktail of pus formation. So we have five main components. We have necrotic tissue, we have living and dead neutrophils, we have RBCs extravasating from the blood vessels, we have inflammatory fluid exudate, and we explained what is the meaning of exudate many times, and also we have the microorganisms, five components. Before I move from this slide, I want to say that the neutrophils that are dead can be also called pus cells. They will be looking like fragmented or um, let's say dead. They are dead but fragmented um, cells. Okay, these are the pus cells. In this slide, I want to show you, uh, this is a neutrophil with a multi-lobed nucleus as best as it could be. And here, this is the neutrophil. This one is living a neutrophil, actually. I am circling the neutrophil, and these are the multiple lobes of, the, of its uh, nucleus. 
Uh, here also we can see something similar to uh, neutrophils and they are kind of fragmented or uh, condensed, having condensed nuclear uh, material. Uh, these actually can represent dead neutrophils or pus cells. As now we understood what is the meaning of separation, what is the composition of pus and how the pus is formed or what is its pathogenesis, now we are ready to move on to learn about the types of separative inflammation. We have localized separative inflammation from the name localized means that it is contained in certain area, it's not spreading in the tissues. And we have another form of separative inflammation which is called diffuse. Here the inflammation is spreading in the planes of the tissues. The best example for the localized separative inflammation is the abscess. And all of us know what is the meaning of abscess. We, I'm sure, have seen this abscess. Either we got it once or one of the members of our families or friends have uh, had abscess before in their life. So what is the definition of abscess? Abscess is a localized separative inflammatory lesion that is resulting in formation of cavity containing pus. Let's slowly analyze the definition. It is localized, yes, because we can see here it is contained in certain area and the surrounding tissues are normal. Separative, yes, it is separative because it's containing pus, this yellow fluid. It is also resulting in formation of cavity. There is a space here and this space is containing the pus. Why we have this uh, space, empty space, or uh, we can say the cavity, it's not empty, it has pus inside, but it's making a space because there is tissue damage and tissue death. What are the causative organisms that can lead to abscess formation? The most common organism is Staphylococcus aureus. And why is that? Because the Staphylococcus aureus produces coagulase enzyme. This enzyme leads to formation of fibrin from the precursor fibrinogen. So we have already discussed that fibrin is like threads that usually localize the infection and separates the infected area from the neighboring normal tissues around. So this coagulase enzyme is going to facilitate production of fibrin in larger amounts to contain the area of the damage and the pus that is formed. This is the main reason why Staphylococcus aureus is commonly causing this type of inflammation. What are the most common sites for abscess formation? The most common is subcutaneous tissue, and I'm sure that many of us have seen abscess in, on our skin and in the subcutaneous tissue. Either we were having this disease ourselves or even members of our family or friends. It's very popular and common. The other site where we can see abscess is in any internal organ, like inside the liver, lung, or brain. Sometimes we have organs with a lumen or cavity inside or hollow space inside, like for example, the gallbladder. Gallbladder is like a balloon. It has space inside. So if there is a separative inflammation inside this space, we will see collection of pus inside. So we will have a gallbladder that is filled with uh, this yellow fluid, exactly like if you fill a balloon with some water. This disease here will be called empyema. So this is what the meaning of empyema. It's accumulation of pus inside hollow organ or organ with central lumen or space. In this next slide here, we are going to slowly discuss the pathogenesis of abscess, which is actually a kind of summary of what we have discussed before. So the causative organisms are introduced into the tissues and they lead to formation of market tissue necrosis and strong chemotaxis to neutrophils. So again, these are the two main parameters to produce pus, market necrosis and a strong chemotaxis to neutrophils. So neutrophils come in large numbers to the area of inflammation. 
Next, many of the neutrophils will die during their fight and they will produce proteolytic enzymes or degrading enzymes that will start to destroy and liquefy the uh, periphery of the necrotic area. So we will start to see liquefaction or fluid transformation of the solid tissues and in the necrotic area or in the area of inflammation that will lead to pus formation. Then we will start to see gradual enlargement or increase of the size of the abscess by further necrosis and liquefaction around. So the abscess will start to get bigger and bigger and the tension inside the space or the cavity of the abscess will increase. We will have increased the pressure inside because if we imagine if this is an abscess and we have more pus inside and it is a limited space, so here we this this tension or this pressure will increase and uh, with time with increased necrosis and increased pus formation this will lead to pain because of this tension uh, sometimes uh, under the pressure or the tension inside the abscess will start to drain they will uh, the, the, the pus inside will try to find a way out because it's too much fluid inside it's kind of uh, something like rupture. So uh, the abscess will start to find the weakest points around to try to pour this extra pus from inside out. Then we will start to see healing process around the periphery of the pus or the periphery of the abscess. And this healing process is actually coming from the vascular phenomena that is starting with inflammation. So we understood before that in the area of inflammation, we will see vascular phenomena, vasodilatation, increased vascular permeability. And also we will start to see a healing process from around. So this will, this zone around the pus will be called the pyogenic membrane. So this is the area where we will have the dilated congested vessels and the huge numbers of neutrophils that are still alive. And this is also the site where the healing process will start. So this healing process, when it starts, it will uh, be having many components. First, we will have fibroblastic activity to start to uh, uh, lay down some fibrosis. And also we will have vascular proliferation, more blood vessels to the area and macrophages. And this uh, healing process, when it starts, it will be called granulation tissue. And don't worry about this term. You will have more and more details about it in the topic of healing and repair. So after all of this has happened, now we are left only with discussing the different zones of the abscess. So, the abscess has a core or center. This is filled with necrotic material and dead tissues, dead cells. And this is the main site of the pus. Then we have another zone around that is still having some uh, living neutrophils and some vessels. So this is a kind of a mid zone. And then we have the periphery where we see the vessels that are dilated. We will see the fibroblasts that are starting to proliferate to a start a process of healing or repair of the tissues that are damaged in the center. So these are the three main zones of the abscess. Central zone that is mainly a necrotic and formed of pus. A mid zone around that is formed of the uh, neutrophils that are still living with some vessels. And then we have a peripheral zone of granulation tissue and dilated vessels um, admixed with fibroblasts. There are some types of the abscess. So there is a subtype called furuncle or boil. This is a very small abscess that is always related to either a hair follicle or a sebaceous gland. So it's a small abscess on the skin related to a shaft of uh, or a hair follicle or a sebaceous gland. So basically it is related to skin adnexa. And the main cause here is staph aureus also. Commonly this frunkle or boil 
can be seen on the face, back, uh, neck, axilla, anywhere. So, this is an example of a pharyncle or boil. This is very, very small abscess with um, the inflammation mainly centered around the hair follicle, as we can see. There is another variant of the abscess called carbuncle. Carbuncle is another type of localized separative inflammation that happens in the subcutaneous tissue where the pus is kind of uh, imprisoned in spaces or imprisoned in a small uh, areas or small separate cavities. We can say also another uh, term, we can say they are present in multiple loculi. Loculi, loculi means that there are spaces or areas that are separated from each other by fibrous tissue septa or by uh, uh, the hair follicles. So in the carbuncle, it is not a single cavity uh, of the abscess. We have multiple small spaces or multiple loculi or multiple small cavities. And sometimes these loculi open on the surface of the skin by multiple openings. Each of them or each of this separative locus is, is like a small cavity uh, developing. So we have a small cavity next to small cavity next to small cavity. And these are all small abscess. So we have abscess and abscess and abscess. And most of them will open on the surface of the skin by multiple openings. The staph aureus also is the most common organism that causes this condition, the carbuncle. And here it's mostly present or seen on the back of the neck and scalp, especially that the type of the connective tissue or subcutaneous tissue in this area is already um, prepared for this type of lesion because there is fibrous septa or there are fibrous septa already in these locations extending from the dermis to the fascia underneath. The dermis is the uh, tissue under the epithelium, the epidermis. And we have also deeper fascia and deeper muscles. So in this area, in the back of the neck and the scalp, already there are fibrous septa. So if the abscess develop in each of these uh, spaces that are separated by fibrous septa, it will lead to formation of the carbuncle. And actually, this is an inflammation that needs compromised immunity, patient with weak immune system. So it can commonly happen with diabetic patients. Patients of diabetes mellitus have weak immunity. So this is a common a site of, uh, or common predisposing factor for this condition. Now we have to ask ourselves a question. What are the dangers or complications or effects of an abscess? So if an abscess is not treated by uh, antibiotics or not drained surgically and the pus is removed from inside, what are the drawbacks? The first problem is chronicity. The abscess will be transformed from acute type to chronic type. And we already explained the meaning of chronic inflammation that is an inflammation with, of longer duration and more tissue damage, and it will stay with the patient for longer time. So this is one of the drawbacks of not treating the abscess very well. The next complication is blood spread. Spread of what? Spread of bacteria. So if the bacteria in the abscess are still present, they may leave the abscess through the many vessels that are present at the periphery of the abscess, and they can spread in the blood, leading to many complications like toxemia, septicemia, pyemia, and all of these emia, 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 we will learn about at the last lecture of the topic of inflammation to understand what is the meaning and differences. Then there is another type of spread through lymphatics. So wherever there are blood vessels, there are always lymphatics. The lymphatic channels, our lymph vessels also can uh, have the bacteria spread inside them. And that, this will lead to inflammation of the lymph vessel wall. So this will be called lymphangitis. Lymphangio means lymphatic vessel. The suffix itis, as we agreed before, means inflammation. So lymphangitis means inflammation of the lymph vessel. This lymph vessel will eventually reach a lymph node. The lymph node is called lymph adeno. 
or yani, this is the Latin representation. If we have inflammation of the lymph node, it will be called lymph adenitis, inflammation of the lymph node. So this is the difference between lymph angitis, inflammation of the lymph vessel, and lymph adenitis, which is inflammation of the lymph node. The last set of complications will be related to healing process. If we have improper healing process and the abscess is not repaired very well, we can see complications like defect of the epithelium or defect of the surface over the abscess. This will be called an ulcer. We can see excess formation of fibrous tissue. This is called keloid. This is extra fibrosis more than needed. So this will lead to like um, cosmetic problem. We will see more and more fibrous tissue arising in the area of the inflammation that is causing swelling or uh, nodules over the surface near the abscess. And we have other two complications related to uh, persistent tracts. Tract from out channel from inside the abscess to the skin or the surface. Uh, when the abscess tries to drain itself or to get rid of the pus that is inside, this pus will find a way through the tissues to reach a surface. This will cause formation of a tract. And we have two types of tracts we will discuss in the next slide, which are the sinus or the fistula. Uh, here this photo is showing a gross and microscopic picture of uh, abscess. Here we have multiple abscess. The abscess center is, as we can see, yellowish somehow, and it is surrounded by an area of congestion representing the peripheral vascular phenomena. Congestion here is showing dark brown color, and the center is yellowish. If we look at this under the microscope, we will see again a center of pus. This is the pus under the microscope. Pus is necrotic tissue, so we will see fragmented nuclei, fragmented cells, tissue debris. This is the center. This is what is uh, the appearance of pus under microscope will look like. A lot of fragments and debris, cells that are not alive. And around here we can see also vascular changes or vascular phenomena in the form of vascular congestion. So this is nice, gross and microscopic representation of an abscess. Now, as we mentioned, these new terms, ulcer, sinus, fistula, we need to understand more about the meaning of each one of them. So what is the meaning of an ulcer? Ulcer is a local defect of the skin or the mucosal surface because of death or necrosis of the cells in this area and the sloughing or shedding of the inflammatory necrotic tissue. So, in cases uh, like inflammation or other cases, the tissues or the surfaces over the area of inflammation will be dead, affected by the inflammatory response. So the epithelial cells of the surface epithelium or the mucous membranes will fall off, leaving a defect. This defect is called an ulcer. This is mostly seen in inflammatory conditions of the skin, inside the mouth, in the stomach, intestine, genitourinary, or anywhere which has a mucous membrane or on the skin. So this is the definition and gross appearance of an ulcer. Then we go to sinus. What is the meaning of sinus? Sinus is an abnormal tract. This abnormal tract is lined by granulation tissue. What is the meaning of granulation tissue? This is the preparatory tissue for healing. Before the, tissue, the, the body starts to repair, it needs helpers for repair, which are, again, we said that before, but we are repeating. Granulation tissue is formed of fibroblast, blood vessels, and macrophages. All of those three are needed to prepare the area for healing. This granulation tissue is infected or septic. So it is infected by bacteria. It is septic in nature. And it is connecting the abscess cavity, which should be here, to the skin. 
So it is connecting and closed space, which is the abscess, to an open surface, which is the skin surface. So this tract is blind-ended. Blind-ended means that it has one closed end and one open end. The closed end is inside the abscess cavity. And because, because it's, it's closed, the abscess is closed all around, right? So this is a closed end. And the open end is on the surface. This is the meaning of sinus. It's an abnormal tract that is lined by connective granulation, uh, infected granulation tissue on the two sides, and it has one blind end. It's connecting a cavity to the surface. A cavity is a closed space. So why there is a, a formation of sinus? This actually happens when the abscess tries to open and drain to the, the overlying surface under the effect of the pressure of the pus inside, when we have increased the pus inside. This is different from the next term, which is the fistula. Fistula is also an abnormal tract. It's not normal in the body. It is also lined by septic or infected granulation tissue, which is the preparatory tissue for healing. Again, it is formed of fibroblasts, blood vessels, macrophages. But the difference between fistula and sinus is the fistula is connecting two cavities. It is open-ended from both sides. It doesn't have any closed end. So how the two, uh, yani what are the two cavities? How we have two cavities or two surfaces? The, for example, here, let's say we have intestine here and we have the skin if we are in the abdomen. Yani. So if there is an inflammation that is separative in nature in the intestine, also the pus will try to find a way out through this uh, forming this abnormal tract sometimes to the overlying skin or let's say for example it it can try to open from one intestinal loop to a neighboring intestinal loop so this tract that is formed between two intestinal loops or two hollow viscera two hollow organs two organs with lumina or uh, one organ with lumen and the skin any two open spaces this tract that is open-ended from both sides is called fistula. So it can be formed between intestinal loop and skin, between two intestinal loops together, between intestine and, uh, for example, urinary bladder, or between rectum and vagina, any two hollow viscera or that are nearby each other, and uh, uh, there is a, an abnormal connection between both of them. So. Another question here, is fistula always inflammatory? Actually, no. It can be seen in inflammatory conditions, but also it can be seen congenitally. People can be, or kids can be born with congenital fistula. Uh, um, a common one, for example, is between the esophagus and trachea. It is called the tracheoesophageal fistula in the thorax. And also, it can be formed in cases of malignancy, if there is a tumor or cancer. This is called the neoplasia, the, the process of tumor formation. So in cases of aggressive tumors, which are the cancers, the cancers also can spread from one viscera or one organ to another organ and form this tract. So also, we can see fistula in cases of cancers. So we have many types of fistula, not only inflammatory fistula. So here we uh, can conclude the three terminology or the three definitions that can complicate the abscess formation. One is the ulcer, which is a defect of the surface epithelium. Two is the sinus, which is an abnormal tract lined by septic granulation tissue, but has one closed end. Blind end means a closed end, and it's usually connecting a cavity to a surface. The other one, or the last one, is the fistula, that is an abnormal tract. Also, it is lined by septic or infected granulation tissue, connecting the two cavities or connecting two viscera that are open to the surface or any other option that is similar. And this is an open uh, tract with uh, both or ends open completely, opposite to the sinus, which has one closed end. So by that, we completed 
the section of localized separative inflammation and we covered the most important example in this type of inflammation which is abscess. Next, we are going to discuss the diffuse separative inflammation. Why it is diffuse and what are its types. So the word diffuse separative inflammation means that we have inflammation containing pus that is acute in nature, but it is spreading widely in the tissues. The two main types of this inflammation are the cellulitis and the phlegmonous inflammation. So what is the definition of cellulitis? It is a form of inflammation that is diffuse and separative in nature, and it usually happens in loose connective tissues, such as the orbit, pelvis, scrotum, but it also can happen in other types of connective tissue, like for example here in this leg and foot of a patient. Why it is diffuse? The main causative organism in this inflammation is streptococci. Streptococci secrete an, um, uh, enzymes called streptokinase and fibrinolysin and also hyaluronidase enzyme. Those enzymes are usually dissolving the matrix or destroying the connective tissue matrix that is present in the subcutaneous tissue. So they destroy any option or um, remove any option for localizing this infection because they are going to uh, degrade all of the supporting tissue, either it is fibrin or uh, extracellular matrix component in the connective tissue, anything that will, will try to localize the inflammation will be destroyed by the enzymes secreted by streptococci. So this is why this prevents the localization of the infection. Infection cannot be controlled or contained in certain area and it will spread over large areas of the inflamed tissue. Grossly, if we look to the inflamed area like we are doing here, it will be diffusely red, hot, swollen, and any lymphatic vessel that is present in the area will also be inflamed, which is called, you can say now, what is the term for inflamed lymphatic vessel? I'll give you options, lymphadenitis or lymphangitis. Lymphangitis, this is inflammation of lymphatic vessel. So we can see here nicely in this photo a case of lymphangitis. This is the lymphatic vessel that is inflamed. Uh, there is pus formation obviously also in this type of inflammation because it is separative. But the uh, amount of pus is a little bit less uh, if we compare it to abscess formation. And this pus is usually in this type of inflammation mixed with uh, blood because of the destruction of the blood vessels. So the fluid is a little bit bloody, yellow, and it's called sanguinous. Sanguinous means a, a fluid mixed with blood. The second type of uh, diffuse separative inflammation is called the phlegmonous inflammation, and this is the diffuse separative inflammation of mucous membranes. So the cellulitis is the diffuse separative inflammation in connective tissues and the phlegmonus is diffuse separative inflammation of mucous membranes. This is good. Then I want to ask you one question before I leave this slide. We have a lesion here. Do you see what the pointer is showing here? What is this? How, what, what is the term to describe this, this lesion? Here I have a defect of the skin, right? There is part of the skin that was sloughed, falling off, showing the raw underlying subcutaneous tissue or dermis. So what is this? How can I say or how can I call it? This is an ulcer, okay? This is a very good representation of a huge ulcer. So let's go back to our case. Five-year-old girl, fever, sore throat, uh, she went to the doctor, 
and on physical examination she has swollen red tonsils as we can see in the photo and this tonsil has yellow spots swab from the yellow spots showed yellow creamy fluid that was sent for microbiological assessment so we can see here in the photo very well the yellow spots or yellow fluid that is oozing from the surface of the tonsils so let's move to the question so what is the most probable diagnosis for this case let's first agree that we are dealing with a case of inflammation now here because we have all the criteria of inflammation like we have uh, signs of redness swelling we have also the fever pain so with all of that we are in the area of inflammatory condition which is most probably acute in nature because we are talking about three days only so we are mostly dealing with acute inflammation but now we are left only to decide is it separative or not separative so with all this yellow fluid and yellow spots that are present here do you think it is separative or not I think it is acute separative inflammation of the tonsils. Can I replace the word inflammation of the tonsil or the sentence of inflammation of the tonsil with only one word? Yes, I can say tonsillitis. So this is a case of acute separative tonsillitis. The next question, what is the nature of the yellow fluid? Only one word. What is this yellow fluid? It is pus. Then, after we decided it is pus, what is the predominant cell in this fluid? If I examine the pus, what are the cells that I'm going to see in large numbers, living or dead? The neutrophils. Thank you. Now let's move on to some few activities to again sum up what we covered in this lecture. Okay, this activity is very nice. We have here pus. This yellow uh, rectangle is pus, okay? And down there, I have some components. These components may be inside pus, and they may be a component of pus or not. You will decide, are these or should these be inside the pus area or they are not actually components of pus? So let's start with plasma cells. Did we mention any role of plasma cells in pus? No, we didn't say anything about plasma cells. Plasma cells are mainly chronic inflammatory cells, and pus is formed in acute inflammation. The next cell, neutrophils. Are we expecting to see neutrophils in the pus? Yes, of course, right? Because neutrophils are the main cause why the pus already is formed. The next component, are we going to see exudates in the pus, inflammatory exudates, which mean uh, protein-rich fluid mixed with cells? Yes, obviously also we will see exudates of inflammation. The next option, are we going to see lymphocytes in the pus? No, we are not going to see any lymphocytes in the pus or very, very few numbers because lymphocytes are mainly chronic inflammatory cells. What about platelets? Did we mention any role of platelets inside the pus uh, material? Also, no, we didn't mention anything as a role for platelets inside the pus as a material. Last one, bacteria. Are we expecting to see microorganisms or bac bacteria inside the pus? Yes, obviously, bacteria is one of the major components of the material of the pus. The next activity, we have two uh, pathological conditions or pathological complications of abscess, sinus and fistula. Which is which? Which one can be called a sinus? Which one can be called a fistula? What do you think? A is what? Sinus. Yes, thank you. 
And what about B? B is a fistula. So why did I make this choice or this um, option? Because here we have attract. Here I have also attract. But here the tract is blind ended from one side. One side is closed in the abscess cavity and the other side is open on the surface. So once I have one closed end, this, is, this will be a sinus. What about here? Why I chose or why I said this is a fistula? Because this tract has two open ends. From one end, it's open to the skin surface. From another end, it is open to the viscera hollow uh, um, or the, let's say, the small intestinal hollow uh, lumen. So this is why we located this sinus to this photo and fistula to that photo. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening and following up with me. And uh, we will move on to the next lecture, lecture number five in acute inflammation to discuss the acute phase reaction or the uh, systemic effects of acute inflammation and the fate of acute inflammation. Thank you very much.